title has changed, um, so I've broadened the talk a little bit. It's okay. Um, it's okay. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for <coughs> inviting me to this f conference. This is a really unique conference, both for the uh, quality of the talks and the uh, interactions, and obviously for the uh, beautiful surroundings. Um, so what I want to talk to about today uh, is <coughs> ways of probing dynamics of spin. So we've heard a lot about that. Um, I uh, bring, I think, a, a slightly unique approach to that, and that's what I would like to tell you about. Um, the first thing I would like to do is uh, to acknowledge the, uh, the people that uh, did the work. Um, Carla Purser is a uh, soon, to, well, becoming a senior student who's doing the uh, NV detection. And she's uh, responsible for the P1 work. So those of you who are thinking about good postdocs, she'll be somebody you should think about, I would advise in a uh, short time. Carla, who is it? <laughs> um, uh, there's a lot of students uh, so who have worked on this over the years. Um, Feng Wan Yang is my colleague at uh, Ohio State who grows uh, many, many things, but in particular, very, very nice YIG that has had a big role in a lot of our experiments. Um, and I'll show you at s one point some interactions we've had with Greg's lab, from whom we've heard, uh, and Michael Flatte is a theorist who has helped us. Um, one thing I have to do is acknowledge uh, the support for my trip today that uh, by our NSF MRSEC. Um, so I have to tell you that it's a great thing. And those of you who don't know about MRSEC, <laughs> you should come and find out because what we want to do is interact with people. Um, and so contact me if you're interested. All right, so th this is what the talk will be. Um, they, uh, as uh, promised, I will talk about uh, detecting paramagnetic, micros uh, paramagnetic spectroscopy uh, using NV. And, and uh, the, the point about this that we're excited about is that it's a, a truly broadband approach where it does not require any particular frequency matching between the NV resonances and the uh, P1 resonances. Um, First, I'm going to talk a little bit about using localized spin wave modes as a mechanism for understanding links between spin transport and spin dynamics. And this is something that has interested me uh, for qu quite some time. Um, the th the in fact, these two topics are not completely unrelated because um, at the heart, there's a similar process of dynamical polarization transfer that is playing a role in both of these uh, processes. And I think it's interesting and, and there's still a lot to be learned. So for the first part, I'm going to talk about uh, ferromagnetic resonance force microscopy. So we've heard a lot about this in um, a field that Dan pioneered. Uh, what we did was turn to looking at ferromagnets with this, this approach. Um, we were, of course, attracted by the possibility of very sensitive detection and therefore the ability to look at very small vo volumes of a ferromagnet. There is a nice twist to this that I'll talk a little bit about. And that is that imaging in paramagnets and ferromagnets is fundamentally different because the excitations of a ferromagnet are not single spin excitations, and that's fundamental to magnetic resonance imaging. Um, the excitations of a ferromagnet, as everybody knows, are collective spin wave excitations. So if you want to do imaging, what you have to do is localize the, l the uh, region of the ferromagnet is that is driven into resonance. And so that's the heart of our approach. Um, we do uh, have to detect this magnetization rather sensitively, and this we rely on the technology of ferromagnetic resonance. Um, so this is the, the technique that I'm talking about. So what we have to do is produce a, a field profile that looks something like this, and this just comes from our ferromagnetic tip, the dipole field of our tip. And the point here is that we create a region in the sample in which um, these modes can only exist in that one spot. In other words, you choose a frequency down here so that none of the spins that experience this field can resonate. And it's only the spins that are trapped in this field well that are able to resonate. So then we trap modes in here, and your intuition for the most part from particle in a box quantum mechanics is very good. We'll see uh, a number of modes that are trapped in here. And so the first realization of this approach was just to image essentially spectroscopy of these modes, which gives you information about local magnetization, local anisotropy. But then um, what we really became interested in is dynamics. So first of all, you can do local measurements of line width and therefore local uh, damping measurements.
But the key point here is that you're only driving these spins into resonance. So you have this opportunity of saying when these spins are excited, and we heard a lot, or at least a couple of talks yesterday about spin pumping, these excited spins will drive spin transport into the neighboring material. But the interesting thing here is that the only interface across, across which that spin transport is occurring is a field interface that's defined by this uh, field gradient. So that a, a, uh, gives us a unique opportunity. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit. Um, so this shows this phenomenon in a thin film of YIG. Um, so, so what you see is when the tip is very far away, you see the uniform mode, that is the whole film resonating the way we would expect, and we're just detecting that mechanically. But then as we bring this tip closer, what happens is this well gets deeper and deeper, the field from the tip is stronger, and more and more modes drop into that localization volume. So you see that the uh, frequency of the n equals 1 mode, the lowest lying mode, splits further and further away from the uniform mode frequency. And then you see, uh, in this case, up to seven modes that drop into this well. And this is observable here because the YIG line widths are so small. Um, and uh, we all know that YIG is a great, great material, so we take advantage of that. Um, the other thing, though, that's important about this from our point of view is that uh, not only does the, uh, that splitting increase, so uh, this well gets bigger and deep, I'm sorry, gets deeper, and what it does is it confines the mode uh, in the bottom to a smaller and smaller radius. So that uh, enhances the shift due to this localization, um, but then you can also study effects as a function of that mode radius. And so we did this. Um, we measured the damping, so this is the, the the standard approach to measuring damping in a ferromagnet, and that is that we measure the frequency dependence of the line width. So we're measuring the width of those lines. We measured, in fact, the first two modes, um, and the slope of that line gives you the damping, and the intercept gives you the inhomogeneity. And so we did this as a function of radius, and what we noticed is that as the radius got smaller, the damping got larger. So we're seeing an enhancement of the damping, which is, in fact, uh, inversely proportional to the radius. So I, um, I will show you that, that data here. So the, the red dots are for the n equals 1 mode. And so we measured the Gilbert damping. Um, and as the, the mode gets smaller, that damping gets bigger. Uh, the thing that was, <coughs> when we went into this, we weren't at all sure what to expect. But in particular, one of the things that's a little surprising about this that we want to understand is that um, although you're increasing the surface area of your mode, so you're making it so it's almost all surface area, and that's why we think it, I mean, that's, so that makes sense that you're going to be able to have more radiation of spin from that mode, you're doing something else that would work in the opposite direction, and that is that you're making this well deeper, and therefore this mode is farther from the energy of these, of these spin waves out here. And it's, it's just not obvious how, how exactly that works. Um, we're going to hear later from Tueno about actually a, a kind of related measurement uh, using NV that I think goes a long way to explaining that. But um, I still think it's a, it's a little bit surprising. And in fact, we now believe that those two effects are in some, in some way competing, and we're trying to do this measurement a little bit better. One thing I want to point out here is also the blue data points. And so that's for the n equals 2 mode. And what we see is that it depends on radius in the same way as the first mode. And this uh, indicates that it is the radius that's the relevant, uh, the relevant variable and not how, how kinky this mode is. That is not the wave vector of this, of this uh, trapped mode. It is, does seem to be it's the radius that counts. Okay, but we would really like to understand this. How does this work? So this was the idea that we had. And so life is always nice in PowerPoint. What we thought we would like to do is take this mode, so here's a little cartoon of the, of the mode, and bring it next to another structure because what we would like, so uh, the experiment we just did, all we have is this big flat plane. So all the modes outside are, are higher in energy. What we want to do is create a little area where we could have another mode, and then by raising and lowering our cantilever, we can raise and lower the energy of this mode, and uh, we, we hope we haven't done it yet. We, we hope to measure the spin current as a function of that mismatch and as a function of radial separation or, or separation in distance. So this is the, uh, 
this was sort of the dream that I'm going to tell you about how, how we're progressing on that. One of the things that this requires is that we be able to pattern the magnetization, the, the effective magnetization of our magnet. So it turns out that that's um, something that's, that can be done. This shows, a, this has been submitted and accepted for publication, but I don't think it's available yet, in which we took the egg and uh, irradiated it with helium. In fact, we didn't do it, we sent it out. Um, and we found something that I, th I thought was sort of remarkable. And so this is showing, well, first let's focus on this, which is showing 4 pi m effective. And you can see up here we're getting values as big as 500 gauss. So this is not a trivial change. So 4 pi m for yig is typically something like 1800. And we're getting enhancements that might surprise some of you. It surprised us. Well, except the literature, it this has been seen. But this you see increases of 4 pi m that are quite substantial. But the changes in the uh, damping up to uh, a certain fluence are not so bad. So you can tune the magnetization without really introducing a lot of damping. The reason, by the way, that it increases is that there's two things that happen. You suppress, I should be careful, this is called, this is 4 pi m effective. We cannot distinguish magnetization in FMR. We cannot distinguish F magnetization from anisotropy. So what happens is the ions go in there and they stretch the lattice a little bit. So they increase the anisotropy while decreasing the magnetization and the anisotropy wins. We don't too much care uh, about that. It's just that we now have this opportunity of tuning 4 pi m effective without really uh, losing a lot of things that we like about YIG. Okay, so what can we, um, can we understand these materials? And it turns out that, uh, and, and can we study them? So what I'm showing down here are spatial maps as we scan our mode across that interface. Um, and we're showing the resonance fields. And so far out here, you get uh, the resonant field associated with um, one side of the interface, and far out here, you get the other. And of course, that's what you expect. But the uh, behavior that we're interested in is what happens here as you're crossing the interface. And what you see is when we uh, go from far away to close, we see qualitatively different behavior. And, and I should mention, I don't think it'll matter much of what I say, but this is for permaloy. In a little bit, I'll show you uh, YIG. Um, but, what, so, but the interesting thing here is we see very qualitatively different behavior here when we get close. Um, and so uh, I'll just take a minute to uh, explain, well, um, the, the reason for that has everything to do with the depth of this well created by our tip relative to the height of this step. So the key point here is that in this case, the well depth exceeds the step height. So let's first look at these. Um, so these are micromagnetic simulations, and I just included this one for, uh, for the purpose of this talk. So what you see is that one of the modes gets pulled down as it approaches this other material, and, one, and the other mode also deflects down. And what's happening is that all cases, you have two modes which are supported, and those two modes live on opposite sides of the interface. So here's the interface in all the cases. So um, at high field, you see all the modes on the NIR side, and at low field, you see all the modes on the uh, uh, irradiated side. The point is, is that you also always get these two distinct modes. So you're just m moving one mode across, and they're all, they're all independent. They're affected by the 4 pi m, by the dipolar field, of course. So you, you all of these things are very, w these, these dots, by the way, are from the micromagnetics. So they reproduce what we see quite quite well. What happens here, though, is that you'll see that at the interface, you only have one set of modes. Um, even at the interface, this mode can live on both sides of the interface, because you've got the well, and then you've got the step contributing in a way that the mode can actually, so it's one mode that lives on both sides of the interface. And that's manifested here in the fact that you get a single step across this interface. So this is a very interesting uh, situation uh, in principle where we can have a mode that lives simultaneously on both sides of this interface and see if we can understand some of the dynamics that occur uh, as we cross that interface. So this is something that essentially this is all spectroscopy. We've not tried to understand dynamics. As I said, this was in Primaloy where line widths were sufficiently large that we uh, that was not something that was possible. Um, so this is 
but this is a, 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 an in principle, this was a study of, of the spectroscopy that we uh, wanted to do in order to enable the studies in the egg. So this shows uh, some recent work, which is just now uh, ongoing, um, and we haven't yet had a chance to study it, or to really understand it. So this is in the egg, and the main difference that you see here is instead of one band, so, uh, so I, I apologize here, uh, I'm now, well, my students, I should say, have flipped this uh, image, so now the displacement is vertical, and this is the resonance field. This is the applied field at which resonance occurs. So there's an interface um, up here someplace, and that what happens is as, so when you're on one, when you're far on one side of the, m of the interface, you see the expected behavior that I just showed you, you see the uniform mode, and then you see n equals one, two, three, four, five. So you just see all these modes that I was just telling you about. The same is true when you're far on the other side of the interface, and of course what we're interested in is this behavior as we approach the interface. So at this point, there's not much to, s to say, but it, we're seeing some similar uh, behaviors we saw in the permaloy. But there is one interesting fact that I think um, is foreshadowing something, and that is we see that this mode uh, loses intensity rapidly as it approaches this interface. And the point at which that occurs varies for all of these modes. And the one thing we know about these modes is that you go higher in order, the modes are getting bigger. So what's happening is this mode hits the interface first, then this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, and starts to lose intensity. So what we really want to do is measure dynamics, measure widths, but the fact that you're losing intensity is, is suggestive of the fact that we're, it's a damping effect due to uh, spin wave uh, transport out of the mode. Yes? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, let me think about this. How do I know what the frequency is? I don't know. I, I actually I don't know exactly. It's something like six or eight gigahertz, but um, I could. This is. I'm sorry. This is all out of plane magnetization. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have we have spectra at all frequencies. Nothing seems to. Well, once we start doing damping, we'll we'll be exploring that. But we don't have. Yeah. This is all out of plane um, magnetization which is much simpler for the reason that was mentioned yesterday, is that you have axial symmetry. Okay, um, I think that, uh, so this is just sort of a w where we are now, um, but I'm very excited about this idea, and I would in particular be delighted if somebody wanted to do some uh, theoretical thinking about how these behaviors, how this should work. Um, we have micromagnetics, I would say, which I'm not showing here, but uh, that show spin wave propagation across this interface, but I think that prob I'm, I'm not convinced that micromagnetics, just including dipolar interactions, is adequate to explain this. <coughs> okay, so there's uh, the converse effect, as we all know, that uh, what I've just been showing you is you excite the magnetization and you generate a spin flow out of the mode. Um, the opposite should be able to you or you should be able to do, and in fact, uh, it's well known that you can do this is that if you have a mode and you apply a spin current, and in this case we're doing it with the spin Hall effect, so we apply both DC and RF currents, but in particular a DC current will inject a DC spin current, which will uh, enhance the, the dynamics of that mode. The uh, unique approach that we're taking, several people have done this, several groups have done this, um, what is known if you're trying to create auto oscillation, that is just use a DC spin current to drive this into oscillation, is that it's essential to confine the mode that you're exciting. If the mode is too large, uh, the, the all of the modes interact. So if you excite one mode, say the uniform mode or the, or the lowest lying mode, due to interactions with other modes, energy flows out of that mode and it becomes difficult to drive that, uh, that auto oscillation. By confining it in the way that I just was describing, you separate the energies of those different modes and you can reduce that mode-mode interaction and therefore enable auto oscillation. What is unique about our approach is that we um, are using magnetic fields to localize that mode rather than lithographic techniques. Um, and there's two reasons that we think that's uh, potentially interesting. One is, again, that this is a rather clean interface, so we thought that what might be a, an advantage. Um, so far, we cannot, there's no evidence that, in fact, we do any better than people that do lithography. 
But the other is that this is now, uh, in principle, a tunable parameter. That is, the height of our particle uh, can be continuously tuned, allowing us to continuously tune that, in that spectrum and measure the mode-mode coupling as a consequence. So one thing I would point out here um, this would be the earlier discussion is in this case, this is all in-plane fields and that's because we're doing permaloy for which out-of-plane becomes hard just in terms of uh, large external fields. So, uh, so the first thing I'm going to show you is if we apply an RF current, we can just do ferromagnetic resonance. We use a, a, a microwave frequency spin current to drive microwave frequency uh, oscillation of the, of the uh, modes of, the, of this localized well, and these are the data that we, ob we obtain. So um, what you see is that zero current, you see a broad band of these localized modes. And so in permaloy, uh, those modes are broad. They, all those modes that I showed you in the egg are very hard to resolve because they're all overlapping. So we see sort of uh, the uniform mode of our big lithographic structure, and then we see a band of localized modes. As we apply uh, DC current, in addition to the RF current, we start to anti-damp those modes, make them uh, narrower, and we start to be able to observe those modes. So we can use anti-damping to see these localized modes. Um, we can do uh, this at a, a range of frequencies, and we find uh, that the anti-damping, in fact, of the localized modes is just as effective as the anti-damping, for instance, of the uniform mode. So we can anti-damp each of those modes controllably uh, using these spin currents. All right, but the real interest here is in seeing if we can ex excite auto-oscillation of that mode. So this is uh, a micromagnetic simulation of the mode. Um, so we think it has a size uh, something like this. Um, this is a big particle, but again, the well that it produces is, is smaller than that particle. So this is... Um, this is the, uh, the strip line that we use for the RF, applying RF. We also apply uh, a DC current. It necks down to about uh, 700 nanometers. And then uh, Zhu Zhang puts um, a na nickel nanoparticle directly on top of that and then d does these experiments. So these are the results. Um, so we're uh, reasonably happy with these. So you, we see that all of these localized modes indeed auto-oscillate. Um, we see that these are fairly coherent modes, um, and in particular, this, these data are taken at room temperature, um, and we see, we clearly see auto-oscillation of several modes with uh, reasonably uh, small line widths. So th this is, we're pleased with this result. Um, it's com competitive with other uh, people, but uh, one thing is that we can get very coherent oscillations uh, at lower temperatures and reasonably significant powers. So um, this is a, a, a nice situation for us, and we're interested in the next step will be in tuning this uh, spectrum and seeing how that affects this ability to drive auto oscillation. All right, so m actually, if there's questions, I would be happy to take those quickly, and, and uh, I will move on. The narrowest, it depends on the material. Um, we don't really know the answer to that experimentally. Um, 100 nanometers seems to be physically what we've been able to do. I should point out that, that we don't directly measure that radius. And in fact, one of the interests we have is we're hoping that with, a, with a, an interface, we can actually measure that radius experimentally. Um, but so, so the exchange length is the limiting thing. There comes a point when you just can't, uh, if you squeeze a mode, the exchange energy just becomes too high. Um, so we believe it's of order on 100 nanometers, maybe a little bit less, but we don't know that experimentally. Ah, uh, you mean by... Okay, I never made very clear, but I don't. If this is, if you're referring to the fact that yes.
Yes. In the sense that if you like any frequency that you stop on, yes. up to uh, from a from if you were taking on from a spectrum of a, a, a FMR gap, the, 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 the shock at the shock of frequency is not about to continue on. Right. Point. Continue. Yes. On the other side, uh, you are localizing the load so you have strict emission at the shock peak. Right. This would be a clear deterrent if you are emitting below the gap or above the gap. That's the whole point. Yes. Yes, 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 sorry. That's exactly, I, if I understand what you're asking, the idea is can we align this mode with this mode? And, but th there's no way for us to m put this mode up into the continuum, right? Because this mode won't localize if we try to make its energy that high. So what we're doing is producing an artificial place nearby, and we, we can, in fact, the, what I just showed you was two semi-infinite planes. So what we're the, the, the data I just showed you will be a continuum of spin wave states over on this side. Yeah, okay. So in terms of parallelization of a continuum of energy, do you think that the way that you do it is going to be for any kind of energy? Uh, I so totally. You say it should be either above the gap or below the but gap. But you, you have to, uh, how do you localize a mode, right? It's, it's, there's no localization mechanism, right? W well, okay, I think we should... If you if you have a way to do that, I we've seen some strange things, perhaps that might suggest that that's right. Well, that might be, but uh, localizing with a, a a mountain is not obvious. I think what you do is you just produce higher energy spin waves in that region and shorter wave vector. Okay, um, right here. Yes. So we, we because we also applied microwave. Currents. Yes, yes. You measure at. You That's right. So then you turn off the applied RF current and you apply only a DC current and measure the high frequency oscillations of the voltage. Okay. So th next I would like to talk about. Uh, what we think is a new approach to detecting paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, so it's related to some of the earlier work, of which I'll, I'll briefly touch on and that we're going to hear later, uh, more detail about later. But uh, one of the things that's, uh, I think, interesting for us is that it's related to dipolar coupling, um, that it's based on dynamics. And so we've heard several uh, references to uh, detecting dynamics with MD centers, and this is a version of that. Um, we're interested partially for the reason that it enables us to study dynamics, but also in this case, uh, it enables a broadband approach. You don't need to have uh, a crossing of the two resonances in order to couple the P1 center that you're interested in or the paramagnetic spin that you're interested in to the ND. So um, you've seen this um, uh, quite a few times. Uh, the only point that I'm going to make that's a little different uh, perhaps than what people have said is that we're using the diamond as a polarization detector. That is, the, the intensity of the photoluminescence tells us the extent to which uh, ms equals zero is occupied um, at the expense of ms equals plus or minus one. So th the idea is simple, and I think we've heard it, but I'll just repeat it quickly. So you illuminate, you hyperpolarize into the ms equals zero state, but then if you alter the relaxation rate, that is the rate at which transitions happen between these two states, you alter these two, the relative populations, and you alter um, the luminescence. So that's the detector. We're measuring the polarization of the ND state uh, with this uh, approach. Okay, so this is uh, uh, a, a very familiar uh, plot, frequency and magnetic field. This is the, Zeman, this is the uh, ground state ND resonance split by magnetic field. These are nano diamonds, so they're not nice straight lines, uh, by which I mean that the magnetic field is not well aligned with the uh, 111 axis. Here is the excited state. This is spurious. Please don't look at it. Um, so the, the interesting thing for us is that we put this in contact with yttrium iron garnet, and we see very clearly the uh, yig cattell equation behavior. So the f so, so this was not expected, particularly what wasn't expected is that this is a very strong effect. 
Um, but the, the question uh, immediately arose for us, how is this, this happening? Um, the answer is that it uh, is related to the fact of fluctuation. So we just heard this discussion earlier. So this is the well-known expression for the relaxation rate of a spin, and that is that it's sensitive to the fluctuations of B, or way uh, magnetic resonance people, as they talked about the spectral density of fluctuations at the Larmor frequency. Um, so the, the story we believe is, is well, th that's clearly the, uh, the answer, is that when you excite the uniform mode, the uniform mode decays into spin waves, and those spin waves create fluctuating dipole fields which change T1. So the first point is, is that this is where we uh, talked to Greg and uh, asked him to do T1 spectroscopy, which he did. And so you see very clearly, so um, what's being shown in this plot is, so this is the same plot, frequency versus field, but instead of just plotting NV photoluminescence, we're plotting the difference in the intensity of uh, the photoluminescence as a function of time after turning on uh, exciting fMR. So, uh, and what you see is that this spectroscopy shows the same behavior. In other words, this the change in the photoluminescence, it seems is clearly associated with uh, a change in T1. Um, so this is related to, to the discussion we had earlier. Um, it's not obvious how low-lying uniform mode excites higher energy spin waves because of the, the shape of the dispersion. We would expect that to be what's required. And so th I, I think that there's still uh, an interesting question, but we're going to hear much more about that. So I think that um, I will move on. Uh, the one point that's worth making, though, is that this is a very strong effect. So it's a very nice way of using, uh, of doing local spin microscopy, uh, which does not require any <coughs> special efforts in, in matching the resonance you're measuring to the, the resonance of the NV. So that this is uh, the approach that uh, it is frequently used is that you um, create fields at the NV resonance frequency, and that's how you observe it. No, no power, we just measure the NV photoluminescence. Yes, yes. So what's happening is that th this uniform mode, uh, well, I think Torino's probably gonna talk about this. You, you uh, excite the uniform mode, this dis decays into spin waves, which indeed have energies that match the NV. But yes, yes, yes. But if you're, if you're a second year, ah, I, I <laughs> yes, but it's, <laughs> um, we can also measure spin wave dynamics, uh, ec uh, in the very same way, so this is uh, a, a, another paper, thick film, where we can actually see all the spin wave, the spin wave branches. All right, um, I promise to be very fast. Um, we got so, so in doing, in the actually in the course of doing some of this work, we started seeing features that we were having little trouble understanding, and we've come to realize that uh, we're seeing features associated with the P1 center. So unlike the NV center, which is a nitrogen neighboring a vacancy, the P1 is just a nitrogen substitution for carbon. There's a single spin associated with, uh, spin a half associated with that defect, and that's EPR active, but optically dark. So uh, this is an NV fluorescence that we're showing, and what we see here are these three features. These are very characteristic of the hyperfine splitting of the P1 spectrum. We also see this mixed state that uh, Vincent referred to, which uh, does have low frequency uh, features, but occurs, but has a, uh, it's distinguishable by its spectrum. So this is um, what I mean by a broad band. We've got a, a P1 intensity that goes up to very high fields. Um, and in fact, I think, sorry, what I will show you is that, so we've measured it up to five gigahertz, and that's only limited again, because we have an iron core magnet. Um, because it never crosses the upper NV branch of the, uh, of the diamond, so there's in principle no limitation to, to the frequency at which you could do this. Um, and the intensity is not changing very much. In fact, somewhat to our surprise, when this P1 crosses the NV, so this is 111, when the P1 crosses the NV, there's just really not much th that happens. So it really has nothing to do with uh, some mechanism that involves direct overlap of those resonances. Okay, so uh, with that, I'll summarize and 
take questions. Uh, yeah.